I appreciate you coming out. And let's, let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you this evening. Lord, we declare you are good, O oh God. We thank you for your mercies, your loving kindness. Thank you for the salvation that you freely have given us through your son, Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, we ask that you would uh, just bless us tonight as we look into your word. Lord, open our hearts, open our ears, and open my mouth to speak, oh God. We want to give you the glory and the honor. Lord, we ask you to bless and protect not only us, but uh, Neil and the others who are traveling, Lord God. Give them a good conference. And uh, we just give you thanks and praise, Father. Commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, Neil has been teaching through the book of Genesis, and when he asked me to teach, he, he, he gave me the option. He said, you can either pick it up where he left off, or he said, if you want to teach on something else, he said, you're free to do that. And, you know, I prayed about it, and I want to pick up on a subject that I think springs out of what we've seen in Genesis, and it's a theme that uh, I feel has affected all of humanity. It's, it's a rather broad theme. And so I just want to sort of identify it and see maybe a couple of ways it might apply to us and then try to look at, see what the, the biblical remedy is, what, what God has done to try to counteract this... this uh, it's a dynamic, and what I'm talking about is a dynamic that's at work in all of humanity since the time of Adam and Eve and their fall. So before I actually get into identifying that and talking about it, I'd like to ask you to think about a couple of answers. I want to ask you a couple of rhetorical questions here. Uh, if you had paper, you could write it down, and that's not necessary, but I'd like to ask you two questions. Number one, who are you? And what would you answer to that question, who are you? What kind of response would you formulate? Where would you go? in answering that question. And the second question is what would you consider to be the most important thing or person or what is most important to you in your life? What do you consider to be most important? I ask myself the same question. I ask my wife the same question. Each one of us, these two questions. Who are you? What is your identity? And what is most important in your life? When we look uh, at Adam and Eve, and I want to look in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 briefly. We'll look at a couple of scriptures here. You know, we've got the creation of Adam in Genesis 1 from verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the, the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then down in chapter 2, we have the, the follow-on from that. Verse 15, 
Then the Lord God took the man and put him in, into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. In verse 18, the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So Adam had a direct commission from God to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, to subdue the earth, and to rule over it. And so then God put Adam in the garden where he began his work. It says there in, in that last, those last, uh, the cha- verse 15 there of chapter 2, said he put him into the garden to cultivate it and keep it. So Adam had this overall commission to subdue the earth, and then God puts him in the garden and says, here is where you're going to begin, son. And so he began then to work there and to learn what it meant, what God wanted him, and what all that would mean. And of course, he wouldn't be working alone. God gave him a helper. And what, what I did not read there, and we've read it before, it's, it's from verse 18 on, that God brought all of the animals to Adam. He said, I'm going to make, give you a helper. Then he brought all the animals to Adam, and one by one, Adam was examining the, an, the animals, giving them a name. And at the end of that passage, in verse 20, the man gave names to all the cattle and the birds and every beast, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the implication from this is that God has brought all these animals to pass by his son, and he's been looking, and he didn't find anything that he thought was suitable. And so I see the training of Adam in that. I see him learning from the Lord, learning from his his father God. And so after that, we know that he caused a great sleep to fall on Adam. He took his side He took a rib or took out part of his side and fashioned the woman and then he brought him to at brought the woman to to the man and said here's your helper and so then together the two of them would move forward to fulfill the purpose and the calling of God so the question you know I'd ask Adam and if we were to ask Adam who are you Adam and what is the most important thing in your life I believe Adam would have to say I'm the son I'm the son of God God I am God's son he's my father he created me So when you ask me, who am I? I have to say, I am Adam. That's my name, but my identity is in who I am as the son of my heavenly father. And what is most important to me? What would, what would be, yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got this commission. I've got, I've got my helper. I've got all of this that I've got to do. Certainly my helper, she's important to me. But the most important thing to me, I believe Adam would say, is hearing the voice of my father, learning from him, being taught what he learned, wants me to to know. And so, what I have felt to speak about tonight is to look at the two different kinds of of relationships, the two different kinds of uh, processes that we live in. And that is, we we normally talk about them in two planes. We've got the horizontal plane. 
And the horizontal plane is everything related to my life, everything related to your life, which is on this human earthly plane. And that's, I'm talking about my wife, my children, my neighbors, my friends, all of you, the family of God, uh, my work, I may have said that, uh, you know, my distant relatives, the people I meet day by day as I'm going about my life, all of that is on this horizontal plane. And those things are important. But the most important thing for me, and it should be the most important thing for me, I believe it was the most important thing for Adam, and should be important to all of us, for, first and foremost, is that vertical relationship that we have or we have available to us to our Lord God, to our Lord Jesus Christ, to our Father God, to the Creator of each one of us. Now, Adam had it inherently. There was no question there. He had a solid relationship with, with God first and foremost. I don't think there can be any dispute about it. There was no sin. There was no separation. Uh, you know, he walked with God, he heard from God, he was learning from God. And so this was how he was created, and I believe he was created, and all of us were created to operate having this firm, life-giving connection to God from which flows out all of our other relationships. And what we find as we look in Genesis, as we look through the scriptures, as I look at my own life, and as I look in society, is that without that firm, life-giving, vital connection to God Almighty, all of these connections around us, of course, they become the most important thing because, by the way, without God, they're the only things we've got is those people around us, those things we're involved in. That's all. Without God, that's all I've got. And that's all you've got. And that's all the people had biblically. And I want to look at that. Uh, I want to look at a few examples here. But all of that became corrupted, became cursed, became twisted because the, because the life and the identity of the individual no longer was, oh, I'm a child of God. So in the case of, if, of Adam and Eve, here we had Adam in the beginning and Eve in the beginning in their perfected, pristine, undefiled state. And so then we come to, to chapter 3, and we know the story, we know how they were tempted, we know how they disobeyed God, and when you look at chapter 3, verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And as soon as they ate that fruit that had been forbidden to them, the relationship they had with God was cut from their disobedience. And so that clear, life-giving uh, that source of their life just like that cut off. And so their eyes were open to the evil potential 
of their nakedness, even though they hadn't yet gone past the eating. That was their sole act of disobedience at that point. And yet, immediately, they looked at each other and they felt shame. And they experienced that shame for the first time in human history and tried to cover themselves. If you look on in, uh, in the next few verses, you see the next result. They, bega- they, they began to have fear and they, and they hid themselves. From verses 8 to 10, we see when they heard the Lord God walking in the garden. Instead of running to him, they hid that fear. And Adam said, when God said, well, you know, what are you doing? I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid, Adam said to God because I was naked. And not just the, the you know, not just the, the, the fear and the hiding then, then, you know, God said, what have you done? And Adam, you know, he's, he's going to shift the blame. <laughs> he's going to say, this woman that you gave me. And so he's trying to blame the woman and he's trying to blame God. This woman that you gave me, she gave me this fruit and I ate it. And then Eve blamed the serpent. So we got this dynamic working now of fear, hiding, uh, blame shifting. And so the relationships in creation, the related, the order of their relationships began to be corrupted, were defiled, uh, and were cursed. So these were some of the immediate consequences of their sin. Adam and Eve's relationship to each other immediately came under stress and strain. That's that's obvious from their blame shifting. You know, we 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 sometimes joke in 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 our family, and you know, we say it's really great to be married because it gives you somebody to blame, you know. And when you feel pressure, you know, oh, (laughs) it's not me, it's my wife, you know, or it's, she'll say, it's not her, it's me. And so, you know, we have fun with that and we don't take each other too, too seriously, normally speaking, (laughs) but uh, it's a fact of life, you know, we do, we do like to blame each other. We want to evade the responsibility for whatever it is that's the, the topic of discussion. It wasn't me, it was her. No, 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 it wasn't me. It wasn't my fault. And so then, you know, as you, as you read through chapter 3, and we're not going to take the time, but you see that uh, there are consequences beyond their relationship. She's, she's got consequences related to giving pain in childbirth. Uh, she'll have this desire for her husband and on the other side of that coin he's going to be ruling over her so you know it's a that is a dramatic change that those couple of verses that talk about uh, their relationship where God said to the woman uh, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you that is a different picture than was seen in chapter 1 and 2 of, their, of Adam having a helper and them working together. That, was, that, whole, that whole relationship they had was corrupted, was twisted. And so, you know, we see here the, 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 the effect of their disobedience from their being cut from that relationship with God was starting to affect their relationships to each other. And of course, the ground, the earth, the ground itself, because of their disobedience, would no longer willingly yield its fruit to them as they, you know, as they were trying to farm, farm the land. Eventually, when you look up at chapter 9, Uh, Chapter 9, verse 2 says that the fear and terror of man was going to be in all of the animals. So the curse 
and the, 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 the product of their disobedience and being cut off from God was having a terribly corruptive effect upon all of their horizontal relationships with the rest of the created order. And so we see different things happening now. Uh, just from them, you see them and, and as their Adam and Eve just being the, the first couple, then as they're getting ready to produce the family of humanity, and we see that humanity is, is now through, through them being separated from God, being put out of the garden, so all of the family of Adam and Eve, all of humanity now is, is seen to be separated from the presence of God and from the life of God. And that's seen, like I said, when he, they're put out of the garden. Uh, you, go, you look at chapter 4 where you've got the story of Cain and Abel. Cain brings an offering from the Lord. He brought some of his fruit as an offering for the Lord. But Abel, he brought the best of his flocks as an offering for the Lord. And so, of course, we know the story. God had regard for Abel's offering, not for Cain's offering. And as a result, you know, Cain, uh, well, it had a tragic result in the family. But the point is that Cain, in bringing an offering to the Lord, he had some inherent disregard for offering to the Lord. He wasn't bringing his best, and he wasn't concerned about bringing his best. And so he wasn't accepted. And then that was birthed into anger between, from Cain to his brother. You know, God talked to Cain. God talked to Cain. Several occasions, you see God speaking to Cain. This, this man who was not really in good standing with God, and yet God is still communicating with him, telling him the truth, telling him like it is. Cain then and told his brother, he said, look, God didn't receive what I gave him. And so as he was telling his brother, he evidently then in his mind and in his heart he blamed his brother for having a better offering, and that's why my sacrifice wasn't acceptable, and it was your fault. And he rose up and killed him. And so, the sin of Adam and Eve now is multiplying out, and it's being seen more in the relationships around them to the point that Cain has killed his brother and he's just enraged with this, with this situation that God didn't accept his offering. And it goes on further than that. You see, there is a degeneration in, in Cain and in the life of man as seen in Cain. If you look in chapter 4, verse 12... After he had killed his brother, this is what the Lord says. The Lord's pronouncing his curse on Cain. And in verse 12 he says, When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. That's what God said to Cain. But now Cain turns back to God and he added two, I believe it was two curses Cain spoke out against himself that God never spoke. God said you're going to be a vagrant and a wanderer and the earth is not going to cooperate with you at all. And Cain said, look, in verse 13, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground and from your face I will be hidden. God didn't say that. God did not tell him 
from my face you will be hidden. Cain imposed that curse on himself. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. God said that. And whoever finds me will kill me. God didn't say that. That's two curses that this man has pronounced against himself. And I believe it is indicative of the corruptive nature of being cut off from the life of God and how it affects our horizontal relationships, including our relationship to ourselves. It's interesting to note that from that point, there's no further indication of communication from God to Cain. He was cut off from the face of God and from the voice of God as far as we can tell. Moving on from there, you see Cain's, Cain's behavior, his, his, his actions show he was defiant against what God had clearly stated to him in his will. In, in verse 17 of that chapter, he had moved away. He moved away from Eden. He moved away from the presence of the Lord. And he found an area he liked. God said, you're going to be a wanderer. And Cain says, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. I like this place. I think I'll settle down here. I'm going to settle down. And he settled there. And so he was rebelling against the will of God. And then I see the character of Cain and, and his focus on himself I see almost an implosion of his character. Of any goodness in him, it was, there was a definite implosion on his part. So he had a son. He moved in verse 17 there. He had a son named Enoch. And, you know, it says he built the city and named the city after his son. We should not assume this is a noble action on Cain's part. He has not shown anything noble in his life up until now. And so the name Enoch, the meaning of it's a bit mysterious. It has, it's thought to mean dedicated. And it does mean dedicated. But it can also mean initiated or commenced or begun. And so, uh, I think we can assume that he did not dedicate his son to the Lord. And I don't believe that that would be the case. And so the name Enoch would seem to reflect his desire to commence or to begin his own family line apart from his parents. And of course, apart from the plan of God. So... He's named this settlement, this first city. This is the very first city that's, that's ever talked about or, or mentioned in the Bible. He names it after his son. Okay, so what? Well, it would seem to indicate his attempts to make a name for himself through his son. And that's what we see, the character of humanity the character of man being cut off from God, it always comes back to self. We see it very clear there in the life of Cain. Five generations later, down in, uh, towards the end of this chapter, ch chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, we see the fifth generation from Cain, a man named Lamech. And what does Lamech do in those verses? He is boasting to his wife about the fact that he's killed not only a man, but he killed a boy. And he says there in verse uh, 23, give heed to my speech, he's talking to his wives, 
For I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And I can almost see this man, you know, sort of boasting to his wives and I don't know. My, it reminds me of my son-in-law. Let me just tell this little story. It's just from the, the point of view of what we men do. My daughter sent us a picture on the phone of our granddaughter and her toes painted. She painted her toenails. And of course, she's trying to put them in her... She's not quite a year old. She's putting them in her mouth and stuff. And her older brother, who's two and a half, he says, Mommy, I want my toes painted too. Now, what are you going to do here? So, thankfully, my son-in-law, he said to his son, to our grandson, he said, David, we men don't paint our toes. We go out and kill stuff. We go out and kill stuff, and then we thump on our chest. We don't paint our toes. Well, I'm glad he told my grandson that, really. I don't want my grandson to have painted toes. But the point is, man, sometimes, you know, we do thump our chest. You know, we do, you know, we get, we get some, uh, some macho stuff going on here, you know. And I can see this in Lamech. And I can see him here boasting in killing and saying, I've done worse than my great, 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 great granddaddy Cain. You think he was bad? I'm really bad. So there is this degeneration of the character, of human character. Lastly, and there's, there's tons of examples through the, through the Bible where you see the degeneration of the, the, the horizontal relationships with people, how they've been totally corrupted uh, after the flood you know and, and we could look at that where before the flood God said I can't bear with these people anymore every thought and intention of man's heart is totally evil he has totally corrupted from the time of Adam till now and of course we know he sent the flood for that reason and after the flood, you know, he went out, and in chapter 11, he started building a city again. And in building the city, they started building a tower. Now, once again, they're in defiance to, to the Lord and to the, what the Lord wanted, because the wa Lord wanted them to populate the earth. And they're saying, we're not going to be scattered. We don't want to be scattered. And so they're building this tower and the, the Bible says to make a name for themselves. And so there is this, this thing of evil that has come into the heart of humanity where self is exalted above any plan God has. And by the way, when push comes to shove, my friend, you will go off the cliff and I will save myself. And so all of the horizontal, uh, look, you, don't, you can listen to the radio or, or pick up a newspaper or talk to your friends or open your eyes at any way for all of us in our neighborhoods, in our society, and what do you see all around you? Dysfunction. Dysfunctional families, dysfunctional marriages, dysfunction and people in turmoil and, and huge issues in human relationships today. From the time of Adam and Eve, their fall, this thing has gone out. And each one of us knows it. Each one of us has experienced it. When you're about two years old or maybe one and a half growing up, 
every one of us, we're going to learn three words. And it depends on your family what order you may learn these words. You're going to learn to say Papa or Dada, Dada. You're going to learn to say Mommy. And the other word you're going to learn to say, guaranteed, mine. Especially if you, when you get a little brother or sister come along and that little brother or sister wants the toy that you thought well, that was yours, you're going to learn that word mine. Every child. And not just in English. We've seen it all over the world. No matter what culture you live in, no matter what language you speak, you're going to learn if not the first word, by the last, by the third word, you're going to learn the word for mine. Because you want them to know that thing is off limits. It's mine. So even with children, the relationships are corrupted. They are corrupted. I think it was my sister's brother that said he didn't, and this was before we had kids. <clears throat> he says, I don't have to teach my, I says, he says, I don't have to teach my kids to be bad. Any of y'all had to teach your kids to be bad? They learned that real good by themselves. You got to teach them to be good. You got to teach them to love, honor, and respect each other because they don't get it naturally. Now, what's not obvious and what, what comes out in bits and pieces in the Word of God is that there is a reason for this. And, and part of the reason, at least, like I said, is that there is a cutoff, there is a separation from each one of us to the life of God until such a time as we fall on our face and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we come and receive the salvation that we can have in Christ. But you, if you remember, God told Adam that he was going to rule. What happened to that? What happened to Adam's rule? What happened to Adam's commission? In a sense, God created him and said, here are the keys of your authority over this creation. I'm going to teach you, son, how to walk in authority over this creation. What happened to that authority? What happened to that rule? Well, it, it's not clearly spelled out one, two, three, but as you study the word, you start to see something. And in the New Testament, it becomes very clear that when when the serpent deceived them and they disobeyed God, the devil said, thank you very much, I'll take the keys to this earth. And from that moment until now, the devil is the prince of this earth. And that's, that's clear from what the Lord said. He is the one who is still in authority here. And, and in fact, if you remember the temptation of Jesus, when the devil said the last thing, he took him up to the top of the temple and he said, you see all these kingdoms in this world? If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you, Jesus, all of these kingdoms. And if it was not true, it wouldn't have been a temptation for our Lord Jesus. It was true. He had all of those kingdoms. And he has all of those kingdoms. So the devil is actively at work here in seeing that his rule is, is played out through us through corrupted uh, relationships and misery. All of our horizontal relationships to our work, to our friends, to our families, to our neighbors, to our children, to our parents. It's all, if he had his way, we'd be killing each other all the time. Because they're all corrupted. 
That's the bad news. That's the reality. And, and you all know that because you live it just like I live it. The good news is this. We have promises. We, the Lord has given promises throughout his word. And I want to give you several of the scriptures. Uh, you can look in, and I'll just name them here. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. Proverbs 3, 1 to 4. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. You see, here's the, the restoration, the, the urging, the charge for, for the child, the, for the one who, who believes in the Lord to, to have that connection to God. Because they will give you, it says, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Kindness and truth, these are all attributes that are worked out in our horizontal relationships. He says, Keep my word, keep my commandment, let kindness and truth be, be yours, let it be working in your life. He said, I'll give you years, I'll give you life. Uh, uh, and he says, you will also find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. So God's wanting to, to reverse this trend in all of our lives. Good repute, good favor. I want, listen, I need favor. I need favor with God. I need favor with the people around me. I need favor with my wife. She's a wonderful woman, but I need favor with her. Because I'm not always a wonderful man. I need to, you know, have that, that, that humility and that, that blessing of God working in our relationship and the other relationships around us. In fact, there's several, there's several scriptures that speak of that. Proverbs 16, 7 says, <clears throat> that's Proverbs 16, verse 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord. You see the, the vertical relationship there. The vertical orientation. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him you see the blessing of God that comes down to us in our outward look at Joseph the patriarch nearly killed by his brothers sold into slavery totally rejected totally abandoned by his family in Genesis 39 in verse 2 and in verse 21 of Genesis 39, verse 2 and 21, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and so he became a successful man. Because, because Joseph, his relationship, his focus was on the Lord. He didn't have anything else. Everything else had been ripped out from him. And so he held on to his relationship to God and God made him faithful. God made him successful, excuse me. He became successful in all that he did. There's a number of other places where people grew in the Lord and they had favor with men. They had favor with God and favor with man. We have examples of Samuel. Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, David I'm sorry, Daniel, not David. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1. And our Lord Jesus, Luke says it himself. He grew in, the, in its stature and he increased with favor with God and with man. Our Lord Jesus, Luke chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 has a very interesting scripture when it talks about this, this connecting to God and having the vertical relationship strong with the Lord and how it affects the horizontal relationships. In Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, 
And, and this is one of the verses that's the key verse for the house churches here in Trinity. Acts 2, 46 to 47. Day by day, continuing with one mind together in the temple and breaking bread house from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so this is a picture of the early church firmly connected to God, firmly connected in fellowship with each other. And it, that blessing of their, the blessing on their relationships in this earth was spilling out outside of their group, outside of the walls of their fellowship as God was saving people and bringing people to know Him. And so the Lord really, I believe the Lord really wants us, the Lord wants to bless all, all that we've got. Every one of us have multitudes of relationships around us. He wants to bless those like never before. But he wants us to come and strengthen and re-strengthen and focus and refocus ourselves on that relationship to him. Let me see. Uh, take some time to look in chap Matthew chapter 6. Jesus talks about some very interesting things talks about, addresses these issues, the issues that came into play in the human race in Genesis, how people were turned towards self, even religious people, how, the, how the, 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 the focus can be so corrupted on self when that, horizontal, that vertical relationship to God is not strong, is not active. He identifies the religious people in uh, chapter 6. He said, beware of practicing your righteousness before men in order to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. And in that chapter, he goes through, the Lord goes through several examples of people who are worshiping, people doing different kinds of religious service and in each case, he shows that what these people are doing, whether it's giving the offerings, whether it's praying, they're, they're doing it so that other people will see them. And so the other people, when they see them worshiping or giving the offering, the other people will think that they are, that's a spiritual guy. That's a, that's a, that's a real child of Abraham. That's a real man of faith. That's a real religious man. That, that whole chapter is, ta is talking about that, or the, at least the first half of the chapter, Jesus is talking about the, that. And he says, beware. Beware. And we must beware. I don't know about you. Have you ever been in a corporate worship service praising God, raising your hands, praising God, and suddenly you're thinking about God, you're magnifying God, you're praising God, and suddenly out of nowhere comes this thought into your mind? I wonder what the people behind you think of you raising your hands. I wonder what the people over there looking at you think of you worshiping God. Now, maybe that thought has never come to you. I confess that thought has come to me. I'm guilty. I don't know if I'm guilty, but that thought has come in and I've had to say, get away from me. <laughs> get that thought away from me. That is a natural, human, fallen thought. And I don't know if I can blame the devil or if I just got to blame my own flesh on that one. 
but it's not good. I know that. It's not good. And I have to say, Lord, cast that thought down, as the Bible says. Bring that thought into submission to Christ and continue worshiping my Lord and praising my Lord. But that's, that, is, that is what we live in. This is the world we live in where everything is seeking for us to make it about me. If I said to you, you got to think about number one, who you know very well who number one is. In this society, in our language, in our culture, who is number one? You got to look out for number one, bud. No, you don't. No, you don't. Not if, not if the Lord God Almighty is looking out for you. You don't have to look out for you. You can be focused on Him. You can be focused on your relationships to each other. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, and I want to encourage each one of us to let the Lord refocus us. I know I need it. Lord, refocus me. Help me to, to keep my mind on you. Help me to, to keep the priority on my lo- of my life, the most important thing in my life. I asked you at the beginning, who are you? And I asked you, what's, what's most important in your life? I want to encourage you to come to the conclusion, come to the, the understanding that you are whatever your name is, that's, that's good what your name is, but that your identity is as a son or a daughter of the living God who created everything that there is. You are his precious son and daughter. That's your identity. That's who you are. And that number two, what is most important to you is having that connection to your Lord. And as you do that, as I do that, these issues that we all have, and we all have them, bumps, things I wish I had done or I had have said, or things that I said that I wish I didn't say, and now I got this crinkle in the relationship, All those things, God will help us to keep them straight and focus on Him and seek to serve Him and seek to glorify and honor Him as we walk together with Him. I have my prayer and belief is that for all of us, we will see what we saw there in the book of Acts, that as we walk together with the Lord, God will give us favor with all, not only with each other, but with the people around us, and that God will add to His church, to His family daily, those that are being saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord God, that in spite of our failures and our unfaithfulness, Lord God, and the dynamic that was set into motion in Genesis chapter 3 that has affected all of us that Lord your redemption is sure your redemption is is more than able to save us and rescue us and to change us change me oh God I pray change my brothers and sisters Change your people, Lord, that we would be able to fix our eyes on you and that from that, you, Lord, you would bless us in all of the various relationships of our life. Father God, we trust you and believe you for it, Lord, that you would be glorified in us and through us. And we thank you, Father, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.